a special program in living color on NBC. And now, Anheuser-Busch Incorporated of St. Louis, Newark, Los Angeles, Tampa, Houston, Columbus, Jacksonville, and Merrimack. Brewers of Michelo, Bush, and world-renowned Budweiser, the king of beers, proudly presents... John Wayne, starring in... Swing Out, Sweet Land. With Anne Margaret, Lucille Ball, Jack Benny, Dan Blocker, Roscoe Lee Brown, Glenn Campbell, Johnny Cash, Roy Clark, Bing Crosby, Phyllis Diller, The Doodletown Pipers, Lorne Green, Celeste Holm, Bob Hope, Michael Landon, Dean Martin, Ross Martin, Greg Morris, David Nelson, Rick Nelson, Hugh O'Brien, Dan Rowan and Dick Martin, William Shatner, Red Skelton, Tommy Smothers, Leslie Uggams, and Dennis Weaver. I guess you're all saying, here it comes. Just put John Wayne and a show about America together, and you're in for a lot of preaching about what a great country this is, and how we should all be patriotic, and love our flag, and be glad we live in the good old USA, problems and all. Well, that's about the size of it, except it'll be short on preaching. Countries are like people. Some take themselves so seriously that you won't get a laugh out of them in a hundred years and others are more apt than not to stick their tongues in their cheek and tell funny stories about themselves and america thank god is one of those yarn spinning places i guess what i'm trying to say is that some folks have the idea that patriotism's gone out of fashion we seem to think that patriotic days are dead we used to sing of our homeland with passion But now we seem to shy away from it instead I think it's time we hit the nail right on the head This is a great country, a great country So let's shout it clear and loud Clear and loud Take a look in your history book And you'll see why we should be proud, be proud. Now hats off to America, America The home of the free and the brave If 
this is flag waving. I said, flag waving, do you know of a better flag to wear? Do you know of a better flag to wear? If this is flag waving, you know of a better flag to wave? Those aren't my words, or Glenn's. They're the words of a Russian immigrant named Irving Berlin, one of the many millions who came to find a better life in the United States of America. It started back in the 1600s with the 13 colonies. In those days, America's only inhabitants were Indians. Since there were no rule books about how to get along in the New World, a lot of the early settlers went about it the wrong way. Like, for example, moving right in on the Indians without even asking their permission. On the other hand, some of our people went about it the right way. That's uh, Peter Minuet joining the group in the year 1626. Why don't we eavesdrop? I want to buy an island. <laughs> How much you pay? Mm, 300 trinkets, many colored beads, 400 bits of cloth, 63 oranges, three French hens. Well, <laughs> me think them Indian get cheated. Trinkets and colored beads and colored cloth jazz, no worth them. <laughs> How much this good for in cold cash? $24 worth. Oh, now you're talking. Not a deal. <laughs> Hold it, friend. I gotta add somebody's getting gypped here. This piece of land you're buying, this Manhattan Island, in the years to come could be the home of millions of people all crowded together on this hunk of land breathing the same air Why there'll be buildings, traffic, smokestacks of industry, a crowded, pulsing, busy city. Hmm. Me think you're right. Somebody is getting cheated. Me give you back two dollars. <laughs> Thank you, tall man. You're very welcome. We see much of you in future in movies. <laughs> I think we buy them much dust in future from tall man. <laughs> the uh, incident known as the Boston Massacre took place in 1770. A real forerunner to 1776, because it produced the first casualties in the American Revolution. I'm Samuel Gray, American. I died at the hands of the British in protest. My name is Patrick Carr, American, and I died for my country. My name is James Caldwell, American. I died in 1770 for liberty. My name is Samuel Maverick, American. I died in 1770 for the love of America. My name is Crispus Attucks, American. I died in 1770 fighting for freedom. I hope it was worth it. So do I, Mr. Attucks. So do I. Boston Harbor, the night of December the 16th, 1773. Town is quiet, the colonists going about their business as usual, except they weren't drinking any tea. Oh, they like tea, all right. They just didn't care for the heavy tax old King George had put on them. So some of the boys decided to do what you're supposed to do with tea, add a little water. Only this time, they added a whole harbor full of water. For the next few months, the fish in Boston's harbor had all the tea they wanted, tax-free. By now, things had gone too far to stop. That's the way it is with freedom. Once you get it in your craw, you want it. You just can't live without it. 1775. With freedom in their hearts, powder in their muskets, and the British in their sights, the men who came here looking for liberty made a down payment on it. Hear that? April 19th, 
blast-off time on Lexington Common. The Continental Soldier was a young man with a dream and the guts to ride that dream. Much as he hated war, he knew that the Declaration was nothing without the independence. So he joined the fight for unconditional freedom, the right to be his own man, in his own home, in his own country. I guess the closest the dream and those kids came to dying together was in the winter of 1777 in Pennsylvania at a place called Valley Forge. And any Continental soldier from Private John Smith to General George Washington who survived that little bivouac knew he'd been to hell and back. But even in our first war, the fighting would stop from time to time for those precious moments of laughter that cushion the pain of war. Hey, this is Bob coming to you from Valley Forge Hope. <laughs> Last night, it got down to 10 degrees below zero, making this the world's first Cold War. <laughs> you know, Valley Forge is so cold, last night I ordered a beer and the head on it was wearing earmuffs. <laughs> and I had breakfast with Benedict Arnold this morning. He said, what do you want, Bob? I said, eggs, Benedict. <laughs> Unfortunately, we ate in the enlisted men's mess. Do you guys ever have eggs on the shingle? <laughs> you guys should have been with me last night. I stayed at a flea bag hotel in Boston. Never closed my eyes. All night long, some nut was running around yelling, the British are coming, the British are coming. <laughs> How we ever got that horse up on the seventh floor, I'll never know. <laughs> if that wasn't enough to keep me awake, some guy across the street was waving a lantern looking for girls all night. <laughs> And he was willing to pay them car fare. <laughs> but not much. <laughs> Only one if by land and two if by sea. <laughs> yes, sir. Paul Revere, the midnight cowboy of 1775. <laughs> hey, and let's not forget those brave guys up in Lexington and Concord. The Minutemen, ready to fight in a minute. Well, you're looking at a half a minute man. That's right, when you got an act like mine, you better be ready to fight in half the time. <laughs> Like my new golf club? Actually, this belongs to Thaddeus Crosby. <laughs> this morning, he played golf with the British and put a whole regiment in the hospital. <laughs> Let's remember why we're fighting this war, men. To get back home to our girlfriends. Remember that. You remember what girlfriends are? Those soft, sweet, tender, caressable young things our wives were right up until the wedding? <laughs> <laughs> and it's no use trying to smuggle girls into camp. Last night, Corporal Stuyvesant threw a fishnet over a topless waitress and tried to bring her in as live bait. <laughs> <laughs> but the general saw through that. Yeah. Uh, oh. Yeah, her net didn't quite cover her gross. <laughs> and I want to tell you, the sergeant knows one of you guys got a girl in camp. He even knows which tent she's in. It's the one with no snow around it every morning. <laughs> Get a load of old Ben Franklin. He gets a hot key in his hand and he's hailed as a genius. <laughs> I get a hot key in my hand, the house detective throws me out. <laughs> I want to tell you, my ancestors came over in the Mayflower yesterday. It was my granddaddy who first stepped ashore on Chrysler Rock. <laughs> Rock. You take care of your sponsor, I'll take care of mine. <laughs> and you remember Bunker Hill? That was the first time our troops ever fought in such cold. Ten degrees below zero. One poor corporal pulled guard duty, shot a redcoat five times, only to find out it was our lieutenant with a chap chest. <laughs> hey, and I want to ask you, doesn't Washington ever go home anymore? Every place I go, all I see are signs, George Washington slept here. <laughs> Even last night at that flea bag hotel in Boston, George Washington slept here. How we ever got that horse up on the seventh floor? I don't know. <laughs> now here's a little lady to sing a song for you. She's a real patriot. I, I ought to know. At three o'clock this morning in my room, she declared her independence. <laughs> and 
And she told me what was good enough for Grandma ain't good enough for her. So let's give the little hand a big lady, huh? Yeah. Here she is, right here. And cleaned and cooked, scrubbed her pots, raised her tots. The dear old gal was hooked. She stitched her little stitches. Her life was applesauce. The thing that was boss. Yeah, the thing that was riches was boss. She had no voice in government, and bondage was her fate. She only knew what love meant. memories. I really shed a tear when I think of Paul Revere. He rode all night to save our plight, but just think of his rear. Oh, thank you. Thank you all so much. Good night, everybody. you all recognize this. The Liberty Bell, it tolled for freedom in the 1700s, and it stands today as a reminder of our great heritage. You know, nation building is a pretty serious business. It usually starts with the word. Man first thinks the words to express what it is that he wants. Once he finds them, he tries to make his deeds and Actions match those words. What better example than the Declaration of Independence? We hold these truths to 
to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are The year 1789, the occasion, the inauguration of our first president. George Washington, having been duly sworn in earlier today, finds relaxation talking to some of the men who helped create the government that is now about to be put to the test of leadership. Sir, Benjamin Franklin sends his regrets. He will be unable to be with you this day. Ah, well. 84 years of age and bedridden, Benjamin deserves his time to rest. Well, without Ben's help, I would still be rewriting the Declaration of Independence. Uh, modestly spoken, Thomas, you'll require such tact as our Secretary of State. The Honorable Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton. Uh, Mr. Adams, Mr. Jefferson, and how shall I address you, sir? Well. This morning, as the ship carrying me here from Mount Vernon arrived in the harbor, I was called by many, many names. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I heard one enthusiast refer to you as Your Royal Highness, President of the United States of America, Defender of the Liberty of All the People. 
And to compound, the band was playing God Save the King. <laughs> well, I... I think of you as Mr. President. Mr. President. Yeah. It has the unroyal simplicity we all see. You know, in the States, people are calling you the father of our country. True, but I, uh, I don't believe good morning, Mr. Father of our country, sounds quite right. <laughs> <laughs> and now, gentlemen, I bid you all good night. Godspeed, tomorrow's a new day. Indeed, tomorrow's a new world. Good night, Mr. President. Good night, Mr. President. Oh, oh, Mr. President. <laughs> Mr. President, I'd like to ask you something. Uh, well, let me put it this way. Is it true that you threw a, a dollar, a silver dollar, across the Potomac? Well, many people, of course, uh, do feel that I threw the silver dollar across the Potomac. Actually, it was across the Arapahannock. Oh, the Arapa... I mean, you're sure it was the Arapahannock? Oh, yes. Not the Potomac? No. Well, good then this dollar belongs to me. <laughs> oh, oh, Mr. President, uh, another thing. Your, your second violinist is lousy. <laughs> Hello, Jack. Working? While the men who had survived one revolution were putting their ideas of leadership to the test up north, down south in a building something like this, a man named Whitney took out a patent on a machine that was to kick us off on our second revolution, an industrial revolution. What do you say we go in and say hello to Mr. Whitney? Everybody pick some cotton sometime. <laughs> Here's his new went to Naples, changed his name to Tony, shoved a pizza in his beer, and called it a minestrone. Howdy, Mr. Whitney. Oh, you can call me Ellie. Eli. Well, nice to know you, Mr. Eli. <laughs> no, Mr. Whitney, you're Eli. How about that? I work here all morning, somebody's out there changing my name. <laughs> Ask you what you're doing? Yeah, I'm just tinkering. You uh, care to join me in a tink? Uh, 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 what's this thing you're tinkering on? Now, you just get your cotton-picking hands off my cotton-picking thing. Well, what do you call your thing? That's my cotton beer. Your cotton beer? You sure you don't mean cotton gin? Well, not on this program, baby. I don't need no eight Clydesdale horses to pull a martini. <laughs> Besides, whoever named a horse Clyde, unless it was Clyde and Dale and Roy and all that. <laughs> Mind if I ask how this cotton beer works? Heck no, you go right ahead and you act. All right, how does it work? Funny you should act. <laughs> I'll tell you, baby. Now, the cotton beer, excuse me, let me explain this whole thing. You get the, see, you get the cotton beer. Now, you got to have, you, you chew this cotton up real good, then you got to have something that tastes good to rinse it down with. How did we get you started on this idea? Well, it was my boy, Bud. Bud? Bud! Come on in here and show yourself to this young man that's doing a bad impression of John Wayne. <laughs> Hi, Bud. <laughs> this is your boy, Bud? Yeah, baby, up until we go swimming. <laughs> now, you show this young man your Australian crawl. I better leave you two alone. I left my horse double parked. How he ever got that horse up on the seventh floor, I'll never know. Meanwhile, back at the country. <laughs> the country at the turn of the century was really busting her stays. The flag was adding more stars. 
Vermont, 1791. Kentucky, 1792. Tennessee in 1796. And on March 1st, 1803, Ohio came in. But two months later, we had a real windfall. The Louisiana Purchase. Have a look at it. Yes, the Louisiana Purchase gave all those restless Americans back east a new frontier, a new place to head to. Folks came from just about everywhere, even including this family starting out from Hardin County, Kentucky, in the year 1814. Whoa! Oh, boy. Why are we stopping, Tom? Oh, it's a dang wheel. Gotta get it fixed. Just sit there, neighbor. I'll get it. Much obliged. Oh, Tom, I'm not sure we're doing the right thing, moving the young'uns and all. Well, of course we're doing the right thing, Nancy. People back east are jammed in so tight that you're like hay in a stack. Can't walk five miles without hearing somebody else's axe or seeing somebody else's chimney smoke. Well, I just pray the Lord will take care of us, Tom. What's the matter, honey? Put your hand down. Now, Nancy, I don't want you spoiling the boy. I'm gonna be needing him with me to do the planting and help with the chores and all. That learning that you're giving him, that's... that's just something that's gonna have to wait its time. Well, then I'll get him up early and start the learning. I'll learn him some more at night. But this boy's gonna know more than you and me ever had a chance to. You know, years back, I used to dream of... doing for you and giving you things, and now everything that we own, we got in this wagon. Heading out in that whole great big country stretched out ahead of us. Nobody knowing what's going to happen to it or to us. Everybody just trying to find his own way in it. But that's all I'm praying for us, Tom. To be a part of something. And to find our own way in it. You and me and little Sarah and Abraham. Now, Nancy, you promised me. You made me a promise that when we got to Illinois Territory that you'd call him Abe. The wheel's all fixed now, neighbor. Well, thank you. What can I pay you? Maybe sometime I'll need a wheel fixed. Well, I just hope that the good Lord sees fit to let us all live long enough for our family to repay yours. Amen. <laughs> Mr. Lincoln, amen. Thank you. Obliged. Yeah! Amen, Mr. Lincoln. Amen. So the child of destiny moved west to grow into the man who would remind a later generation that an earlier generation had declared all men are created equal and who died trying to prove it. But in these early 1800s, other men were proving other things. This printer here, he puts out a page a day guaranteed by the First Amendment that whatever he prints, folks have a right to read. Let's go ahead and see what's news. <laughs> what seems to be the trouble, printer? Oh, I can't get this darn thing to work. Why don't you get it fixed? 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 You can't do that. <laughs> Have you heard of freedom of the press? Can't fix the press, you know. <laughs> Can you make a good living at it? Oh, yeah, yeah. There's big money in printing. Wait up. <laughs> that bill has Martha's picture on it. Okay. Well, they just said put Washington's picture on it. They didn't say which one. <laughs> well, anyhow, she looks like George. Especially from the back. <laughs> well, I guess old habits are hard to break. Huh? I see Paul Revere was out horseback riding again last night. Yeah, how he ever got that horse on the seventh floor, I'll, I'll never, never know. know. <laughs> you sure seem to like your work, Oh, printer. I love it, I love it. I've been a printer all my life. Uh-huh. I guess you might say that I've got printer's ink in my veins. Printer's ink in your veins. In all of them. Got a pin on you? I'll show you. 
Here it comes, folks. <laughs> oh. <laughs> How about that? My right arm doesn't know what my left arm's writing. <laughs> I sure would like to know how this whole shooting match worked. Well, you're too late for today's paper. Oh? Oh, yes. We've already put her to bed. Oh, too bad. Yeah. Want to go upstairs and kiss her goodnight? This is better than what we got. <laughs> Say, why don't you mosey out to California and get rich in the big gold strike? Gold strike? California? That doesn't happen for 50 years. I know that. But look at the head start you'll get. <laughs> Senator, here's the editorial you wrote. Oh, yes. Um, before you go, stranger, tell me what you think of this uh, little editorial that I've written. Mm. Be glad to. Let us be aware in these infant years of our beloved republic, there are those who wait to celebrate our failure. Be not disheartened. This will always be so. For we have lighted our candle of liberty in a dark world. And each of us is in charge of keeping it lighted. And though the winds of dissent may threaten our flame, despair not, remembering that a nation which allows dissent is stronger from within and brighter from without. For when dissent becomes a crime, hope becomes despair. Dissent, but dissent honorably. Dissent with faith in your hearts, not despair. To sent to rebuild, not to destroy. To sent from within, for to sent from without becomes attack. Speak out for what you believe in, at least as loudly as you speak against the system. For gentlemen, if ours is a generation to say democracy will not administer to the people, let it be a conscious decision arrived at only after every opportunity for man to rule himself has failed. Printed. And it must have worked because in the early 1800s, we kept adding more states. 1812, Louisiana. 1816. The great Hoosier state of Indiana is proud to add another star to our banner. 1817. The magnolia state of Mississippi and all her own star-spangled citizens are proud to become the 20th state. 1818. What so proudly we hail now flies over the new state of Illinois. 1819. The cotton state of Alabama is pleased to join the home of the brave. 1820. Great pine tree state of Maine passed this vote to join the land of the free. Yeah. 1821. The Show Me Territory of Missouri becomes the 24th state by the dawn's early light. Andrew Jackson's presidency marked the victory of the common man in America. Earlier presidents had been from the aristocratic class. Now one of us was in there, and he was having himself a time. The fancy minuet was drowned out by a Cajun fiddle and a black American invention called the banjo. I come from Alabama with my banjo on my knee. 
I come from Alabama with my banjo on my knee. I'm going to Louisiana, my true love for the sea. It rained all night the day I left, the weather it was dry. The sun's so hot I froze to death, Susanna, don't you cry. Oh, Susanna, oh, don't you cry for me. I come from Alabama with my banjo on my knee. The 1800s brought some good news and some bad news to the country. Good news came in a fistful of states, starting in 1836 with the proud and great state of Arkansas. Then in 1837, the Wolverine State of Michigan, 26 star on our flag. Two in 1845. And Florida, the sunshine land. 1846. The Hawkeye State of Iowa. 1848. The Badger State of Wisconsin. 1850. The Golden State. California. 1858. The Great North Star State of Minnesota. 1859. The 33rd State. Oregon. 1861. The Sunflower State of Kansas. 1863. The Mountain State of West Virginia. 1864. And the 36th State, Nevada. The bad news of the 1800s came in the form of a pretty rough argument. Because for the first time in our lives, we were having a family fight. This is Appomattox, where it supposedly all ended. The tombstone reads, Civil War, rest in peace. Born 1861, died pretty soon, I hope.
one came home one stayed behind a cannonball don't pay no Eighteen sixty five, April. Two events. Abraham Lincoln gave up his life. Robert E. Lee gave up his sword. One more blue, one more gray. the North and South were back together again. It was up to 3,000 miles of steel track and 10 million feet of lumber to join the East and the West. train whistle was his music, the rhythm of the wheels his heartbeat, and the coal and steam his blood and sweat. The train is life. Bullet! <laughs> they call the westbound crew that worked for the Union Pacific, mostly Irishmen who left their native land to escape a famine. Hard working, hard living, hard loving, burly men that would wage a month's pay on a fist fight. Men of determination and purpose, for nothing could stop their ever westward movement. Ten spikes to the rail, 400 rails to the mile, two miles of track a day. Rolling. Rolling on 
down to Promontory, Utah, we are rolling through the prairie grass and a mountain pass, breaking trail for the rail and the iron wheel. High and east to west with the ribbon of steel. Out in California, they were faced with a gigantic task of driving a railroad east right through the Sierra Nevada Mountains. A wall of solid granite 100 miles thick. 16,000 men, mostly young Chinese, labored the summer's ball and sun and in a bitter blast of wintertime, moving ton after ton of earth, timber, and stone. Not with machines, mister, with elbow grease, shovel and pick, man against mountain, muscle against mountain, brains against mountain. And those days would pass that it looks like a mountain might win. In the end, it gave away. Rolling, rolling, on to Promontory, Utah, we are rolling. Through the prairie grass and a mountain pass, breaking trail for the rail and the iron wheel. High and east to west, with a ribbon of steel. At Promontory Summit, on May 10th, 1869, the last spike, a golden spike, was driven into a laurel tie. And from Omaha, across the Nebraska Plains, over the Rocky Mountains of Wyoming, a distance of 1,086 miles, came locomotive number 119 to gently kiss cow catchers with locomotive Jupiter out from Sacramento, 690 miles away, over the Sierra Nevada range. And around the nation was telegraphed a single word, done, and east and west were one. Rolling, rolling, on to Promontory, Utah, we are rolling. Through the prairie grass and a mountain pass, breaking steel for the rail and the iron wheel. High and east to west for the ribbon of steel. out like veins in a body above the ground. The veins of gold and silver were petering out below the ground. Still, the iron horse didn't put the four-legged one completely out of business. Somehow, the cowboy managed to hang on. But it was different for the miners, because when they struck out, there was nothing left to do but pack up and get, leaving their empty towns behind them ghost towns. The old west, the wild west, is long gone. But that doesn't matter. What does matter is that nothing ever dies if folks don't want it to. How much for a room and bath? We've been known to get $50 a night when times are good. How much tonight? Uh, One dollar. Sheriff, how come you got me locked up in this stood jail? Because last night you got yourself in a fight, sent 14 men to the hospital. What was the fight about? About whether we need a larger hospital. <laughs>
Must be a lot of ghosts around here. Bet I know how to wake them up. Beer for everybody! <laughs> In a cabin Excavating For a mine Dwelt a miner 49er And his daughter By the time 1888 rolled around, the women folk were hungry for another try at the White House. They'd already made one stab at it back in 1872, when they ran Victoria Claflin Woodhull. This time, they all got behind Mrs. Belva A. Lockwood. Now, how would that sound? Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, Mrs. Belva A. Lockwood. Yeah! Let's
action, I want all of you to know one thing. This girdle is killing me. <laughs> I am here to ask for your support. I want your support. I need your support. I beg your support. Because you know I look better with all the support I can find. <laughs> Anytime, except uh, Thursday when I'll be doing my hair. <laughs> you all know my slogan, the White House or bust. Yeah! Yeah! You'll never get in the White House. And you'll never get a bust either. <laughs> and when I'm elected president, the White House will be a pink house. Yeah! And all future wars will be fought by men over 70. <laughs> Be canes and slippers. Yeah! <laughs> By the time the century ended, we had close to 76 million between our oceans. The new nation had become the dream of people all over the world, and millions came in leaps and bounds, with little more than the clothes on their backs and hope in their hearts. And all they asked was for a chance to put their two hands to work in our free marketplace. Europe's poorest became America's middle class. Men willing to work found no limits on their ambitions. And so in our first two centuries in this God-given land, men with a dream had converted untold acres of forests and lakes and rivers and plains, mountains and valleys into a land of opportunity. Here is a lady that came to our shores from France in 1886, Miss Liberty. Yay, Mr. Clemens. Well, nice to see you, Frederick. Uh, won't you pull up a thought and join me? I'd be delighted to sit with an old and respected friend. Thank you. This is quite a moment. Samuel Clemens, alias Mark Twain, born 1835, died 1910, meets Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey, who later shortened that to Frederick Douglass to protect his life. Born 1817, died 1895. Let's listen in. Every word you're about to hear is true, mostly in direct quotes from these two gentlemen. Accent on the gentle. Sitting here, I, I find myself trying to imagine what Huckleberry Finn would have thought about that grand old lady out there in the harbor, or Tom Sawyer, or the girls, Becky and Polly. Or my favorite, Big Jim. Sad to say, you know, some of your friends object to the character of Jim and Huckleberry Finn. Of course, I can only regret that they're behaving as stupidly as whites often do. I doubt those who criticize you are aware, as I am, of two young men of my color you sent through college. I'm so proud of those boys, too. Well, you should be. One, a gifted minister. The other, a graduate of Yale Law School. Our country can use more of both. I happen to believe very strongly in the family of mankind. And on that premise, whatever I can do for my fellow man of any color is my partial reparation for treatment others may not have accorded him. Goodness is due from every white man to every black man. You are living proof, Samuel, that men are better than their theology. You know, I do believe I saw Miss Liberty up there cock an ear to hear that. It would not be the first time I've spoken to her. <laughs> I know what you mean. I've told her a few things myself. I have been blessed with liberty thanks to those who came before me to this land. 
And I have been blessed with thoughts of liberty, thanks to those who will come after me in this land. Dignity has shaken my hand. And waved at me. I am aware that there are wrongs to be righted. Because of rights that have been wronged. I have known freedom since I was born as a child. And I, since the day I escaped as a slave. I have long been concerned with injustice in our states. And I of the state of our injustice. As the midnight of my day on earth draws near, I ask nothing but the improvement of mankind. Of all mankind. I have never claimed my country to be perfect. Nor have I. There's opportunity for improvement in these not so united states. That they may truly be united states. I have no doubt that such improvements will be made eventually. Hope burns within me. They will be eventually. I have made every conscious effort to live by the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. She's a mighty lady. I wonder what she thinks about these years. I don't know, but I imagine she prays a lot. Lord God, who has brought millions to our shores, grant that each of them shall find the freedom he sailed for in this land, which honors all who honor it. Lord God, who has brought man from wagon train to space capsule and filled this great country, imperfect though it may be called by some, Give equal dignity to all. Lord God, remind fiery young hearts that passion works best when tempered with reason and that nothing was ever built up and torn down at the same time. Lord God, remind us constantly the land we call home wasn't built in a day. Bear with our failures, forgive us our trespasses. Lord God, the torch I hold high is liberty's nightlight. Well, here we are way down south in North Carolina. Kitty Hawk, to be exact. A couple of Ohio brothers got their heads in the clouds. I see by the sign that you boys are the right brothers. Right. Well, you might say I'm a right brother, but Orville here, he's a little more on the liberal side. <laughs> Talk around town is that you're building a flying machine. I didn't know that. <laughs> well, what did you think we were building? Looks like just another bicycle to me. Well, what did you think when we put the wings on it? I thought it had died and gone to heaven. <laughs> Let's get back to work. We're going to make it possible for man to fly. You should have seen me last night. <laughs> you were flying? Stacked up till midnight. <laughs> Your plane was stacked up till midnight? No, my girl was. I don't want to hear about it. Folks say that you've been working on something in this barn that may get man off the ground. And I want to know the principle behind it. Did he say he's got the principle on the ground behind the barn? <laughs> Good, because the math teacher's a lot more fun. I, I don't want to hear about it. But tell her not to bring her horse. I don't want to hear about her. Because she never lets you lock the barn door until after the horse is gone. <laughs> Go to your room. I can't. The horse is in my room. How he ever got that horse on the seventh floor, I'll never know. <laughs> well, I can see that you boys are busy, so I'll just mosey along. Come back any time, stranger. I don't want him to come back any time, stranger. <laughs> That's not what I meant. He's strange enough right now. <laughs> That's not what I meant, and you know it. I mean, if he comes back any stranger, I don't want to be in the same neighborhood. <laughs> you don't want to be in the same neighborhood. That's funny, neither do I. <laughs> well, don't worry about it. Chances are we'll never see him again. Never see John Wayne again? <laughs> What's the matter with you? We're playing a scene in the late 1800s. Don't call him John Wayne. John Wayne hasn't even been born yet. And we are the Wright brothers. Now, have you got that straight? Of course. Good. We just had a nice long talk with a guy who hasn't been born yet. <laughs> and we're the Wright brothers. Tommy and Dickie. <laughs> Tommy and Dickie are not the Wright brothers. That's CBS propaganda. 
Right. Come on. Have it your way. Now, let's finish this airplane. Good, because I already hired a stewardess. <laughs> a stewardess? What do we want with the stewardesses? We're, we're building a plane to carry cargo. You should have seen the cargo this stewardess was carrying last night. <laughs> you want to give it another try? OK, all, all right. right. Now then, get the trim tab set this time. Ready, Wilbur? Ready, Orville. All right, contact. Contact. There we go. I'm sure there were a lot of folks back in... I'm sure there were a lot of folks back in those days who truly believed that if God had intended man to fly, he would have given him wings! I wish we had more time to talk about some of the many wonderful things that have happened since you and I were born. But the old clock on the wall's got a beat on me. Now I guess I have just enough time to thank the wonderful Budweiser family for bringing us into your homes. And my thanks to all the beautiful people in front and back of the camera who are brought together tonight by their own goodwill and love of country. I'm a lucky fella for many reasons. Lucky that I was brought up to believe in a lot of things I found worthwhile. I believe in common decency, without which no society or goodwill can exist. I believe in my country, my family, my fellow man, and my God. I believe in straight talk and freedom with an accent on the free, which is still the best four-letter word I know. I believe in giving a fella a second, even a third chance. But keep your eye on him. I believe the moon's a nice place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live there because this country on this planet is man's last chance to make a go of it for humanity. And I believe there's time in my life and yours to get this country in such shape that God would be proud of it. I believe your kids and mine are just you and me getting a second crack at the world. And our job is to see that they don't make all the mistakes we did and don't invent too many of their own. I believe 99% of them are a credit to their folks, a pride to their country, and deserve a pat on the backs from all of us for being what they are and not waving a white flag at life. I believe in hope for people of all ages, that equal opportunity is based on equal obligation. And speaking of opportunity, American opportunity has no limits, has been known to knock more than once. How about you very young people who see a tough life ahead? Well, when Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox, Booker T. Washington was a nine-year-old slave. Yet by the time he was 28, he became president of Tuskegee Institute. And at eight months, Neil Armstrong took his first small baby step toward mankind and fell flat on his face. At six years old, Mickey Mantle was settling for a base on balls. At seven, Will Chamberlain nailed a practice hoop over his garage without a ladder. And at eight, Charles Lindbergh was flying a kite, wondering how it'd feel to be up that high. At nine, Bert Bacharach was thinking the piano lessons had never end. How many of you are pushing 50 and complaining that the country is going to hell? Crispus Attucks was in his 40s when he died on State Street in Boston, fighting for the freedom that we share. And John F. Kennedy was 44 when he asked not what his country could do for him, but what he could do for his country. And how many of you over 65 are just settling down not a rest after a busy life? Well, a fellow by the name of Eisenhower, who had already lived one lifetime as a soldier, was re-elected to the presidency when he was 67 years young. Well, by now, I've made my point, or I never will. Oh, there's one other thing. Every man and woman or child I've ever known, met, seen, or heard of wants one thing more than anything else in the world. And that one thing is tomorrow. Tomorrow, that's the only thing any of us have going for us. And I believe this. If tomorrow all of us, every single one of us, gets out of bed and says, this is my country and I'm going to do good for it, 
We'll make the greatest step forward since a pilgrim's foot found Plymouth Rock. Tomorrow, remember, this is my country and I'm gonna do good for it. Just might work. We'll never know unless we give it a fair try. Oh yeah, and there's one other thing I'll say tomorrow because I say it every day of my life. God bless America. Man that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairie. Appearing in tonight's cast were Kathy Baker, Bernice Dalton, Jane Harris, Paul Reed Roman, Lisa Todd, Arthur Tovey. This is Ed McMahon. Bush Incorporated, brewers of world-renowned Budweiser, the king of beers, has enjoyed bringing you the John Wayne special, Swing Out Sweet Land, and wishes you a pleasant good evening.